We have 700 acres here, um, of which 100 odd acres are blue gums and about 100 acres of um, remnant vegetation that we've fenced off. Overall, we've about 460 acres of pasture, taking out that new renovation of blue gums, and we run about 2,500 ewes and lambs. So we have a very high stocking rate. So prime lambs and wool are our focus. Uh, we also grow a fair bit of fodder, so we sell haylage and hay as well. So look, very it's sandy, highly leached soils because our rainfall is technically meant to be 750 mils on average. Um, so it's a, a winter rain, winter spring rainfall. Um, but our soils are, are, are sand over clay generally, some gravel over clay. They're very acid soils. Because of the leaching, I, I suppose that you'd call them fairly low nutritional soils. But because you know we have such high organic matter levels now, we have really good um, moisture retention. And here we are near Christmas and, you know, this is our, our rye regrowth um, from our haylage cut, um, which will harvest this for seed. Our, our limiting factor is, could be water, and it's a nice way to be if we can confidently say that we've got very good production um, and a year like this where we have reasonable spring rains, um, we just can't keep up with the growth. It doesn't matter how many sheep we have and it doesn't matter how much we cut. Mm. That's a bloody good problem to have. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> There's two farms. Um, our original farm, um, we've been here since 1979, um, and the second farm which we're standing on here, we've had now for 15 years. Um, our production was uh, very low, particularly on the farm we bought. We bought. Um, it was quite run down. In fact, we know the history of these of both farms right from from Newland, which has been really interesting. Production was quite low. Um, we were conventionally farming uh, up until about 25 years ago. Uh, so we were, we, you know, we were the super super potash, super copper zinc, and you know those sort of things. We nitrogen wasn't used a lot in those days, but it was coming on. Urea was starting to be used a bit, um, and we moved away from um, traditional practices here about 25 years ago um, there was mainly because we didn't see a big response with the super applications and we couldn't sort of quite understand why out of all the minerals only we're only applying one or two the other thing we found is that you know our lambing percentages in our sheep were actually declining um, and our wool quality was declining in older ewes. The other thing is we, were, we even in those days we were concerned about um, nutrification of waterways um, and Wilson Inlet is our catchment which is Denmark from here and phosphorus and nitrogen were issues there so you know we felt that there was a bit of an environmental challenge as well. You know we were spending more on fertilizers, um, we were starting to use herbicides um, which we were nervous about anyway um, so we uh, we decided to change and and so in the late 70s, early 80s, I sort of took a sabbatical, as it were, and had an old BMW motorbike and went around Australia. And, and I, I ended up working on um, biodynamic farms. Um, I even buried cow horns on Podonitsky's farm in Victoria. Um, I worked on Yeoman's Key Line system, or it was actually Yeoman's and Wallace. Um, permaculture, uh, you know, I actually was in Stanley sort of volunteering for a while on permaculture. So I sort of had a really good look at all the different, I thought, which was around. And the standout for me was a bloke called Wallace in Kiwa Valley in Victoria. Um, and he was the first, he really developed with Yeomans the first uh, soil conditioning equipment, which was sort of deeper ripping and, uh, and his place was amazing, absolutely amazing. And so looking at biodynamics, looking at permaculture, it was Wallace that stood out for me of that trip. Anyway, we came back and we continued on our conventional farming process and until it really started hitting us in the pocket, I suppose. Yeah, so 25 years ago we, we changed to a biological process. The main focus for us on the farm was firstly, is our main assets, our soil. It's not the equipment in the shed or the fencing or, you know, it's our soil. And so we focused on soil health as number one. We realised that we're actually farming a rhizosphere. And so that's what our focus became. And a big part of that was remineralisation. You know, we, we were taking liquid minerals as part of a supplement in our health, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, um, because there was a fair bit of evidence then that actual, even though we were people were increasing yields in farming, the actual nutritional quality was going down. Um, and I still think that's happening now. 
we focused on ore minerals rather than sulfate minerals. Ore minerals are sort of finely crushed rock minerals. You know, there are other minerals, and as I say, it's a little bit more involved, but the fundamental is we wanted to make sure that we had, you know, um, not just some phosphorus, but we wanted to make sure, or potassium, we wanted to make sure we had copper, zinc, cobalt, selenium, nickel, germanium, and all these weirdo ones that people don't even know, but there's a fair bit of evidence that they're all important. They're all not only important for our health and our animals' productivity, which is what has been a huge turnaround for us, it's really important for the microbes. We also focus on what we don't do, you know, I mean, this sounds a bit weird, but um, often what you don't do is important what you do do. Um, and, and we knew there was a, a pretty negative link between a, a lot of pesticide applications. Um, the obvious one's fungicides, so we don't use any fungicides on this farm and haven't done for 25 years. We don't use any insecticide on the farm. Um, and herbicide we will use really strategically. There are a bunch of side effects in any application of chemical. It's like any drug we take, there's a bunch of side effects. Unfortunately in ag, the side effects aren't really, I reckon a lot are known, but they're not published as it were. And there's some really good research on this that any pesticide application can halve your rhizobia nitrogen fixes, um, one application, and halve your uh, natural uh, free living nitrogen fixes. Well, you know, then suddenly you have a nitrogen deficiency. You know, you're, you're, so these are the sort of side effects. So it's not just about killing a weed or, you know, killing a bug, you know. There's a whole pile of effects that you, you have to consider and we don't know a lot of them, so we err and caution and say, well, it's the last resort. Over the years, we've been the also ranch, you know, we've been the weirdos and, um, <laughs> and now we produce more than all of them. And one comment, um, and it was a bit of a term of endearment, I think, but it was called Frosty's Fairy Dust, you know. <laughs> Now, you know, and, and I, I go, fine, you know, and then they come out and you see this is regrowth that we're standing in right now for harvest at six, seven weeks after cutting, you know, 20 rolls a hectare of haylage. And um, look, I, I don't, no, it looks, been quite negative, really. Um, and, and I think people like us, and I'm not the only one, you know, who are doing things differently and successfully. Um, uh, yeah, they just, I don't know, I, we're not threatening anybody but I f you feel like that's what the vibes are. Look, I'm, 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 it's what really upsets me more than anything is, is you know, the, it's the way the agronomy is in Western Australia. Um, it's really absolutely chemically oriented. We've got to produce good quality food. And it's not just about a, a ton to the hectare or 10 tons to the hectare, it's about the quality of that, the nutritional value of that. Um, and this other thing is we do have a responsibility because really farmers occupy most of the land in this country um, is that we have a responsibility to the environment and, and as I say my work with land care groups and stuff showed that wasn't happening um, and so, so I, I think we have a social responsibility which is really good food quality, we have an environmental responsibility that you know that what we do on the farm doesn't damage someone else's farm or it doesn't run off and damage the Wilson Inlet or whatever else. So we do have that sort of responsibility and that's where we've got to manage our fertilizers really well. Nitrogen applications are a classic. And the other thing is we've got to be financially there's economics in it. And that's what I like about the system. You know, our inputs are less. So you know we have a responsibility that goes beyond our gate. And, and that was a, a, a bit of a driving thing for us. And, and to be able to achieve it and actually get really good production, and that was our challenge. We, we just wanted to, um, you know, put it up them as it were and just get a lot better production. So that was our challenge, yeah. You know, I think chemical farmers shouldn't be knocking a biological farmer. Um, I, I won't knock a chemical farmer because I think some of the practices are right. And, and I think, you know, but I think there's a lot more to it. And, and I think we're understanding that biology drives us, it drives our health, it drives our animals' health. Biology, you know, I believe is the driver, the main driver in ag, not, chemi not, not chemistry. Um, so here we, we, you know, we run a very acid soils here, you know, we have pHs as low as 4.5 and we have massive production. Um, and so I think that's a biological function, you know. Um, but l looking at, the, I suppose, the bigger picture is um, 
um, you know, we're, we now realize that our gut microbes are so important to our health, to our nutrient use efficiency, you know. If we have good gut microbes, we get a lot out of our food. Well, it was Charles Darwin who said that, you know, that the soil is the gut of the earth. And there's someone hundreds of years ago that was, I believe, so spot on. And so, so and, and that's a biological function. Um, you know, they, they say our body has more bacteria than cells. You know, so we, we've got to think the same for our soils. And, and so for me, it's, it's the biology that drives it. I heard a report just recently that they believe there's two and a half million species of fungi and they know 6%. You have no idea what that relationship is, other than my attitude is try to promote that relationship in our limited knowledge. And it's what we do do and what we don't do of equal, equal importance in that. Biodiversity in plant species, I mean, someone else's weeds might be our, some of our favourite plants. And of course, ryegrass is a classic. Here it is, here, look at the ryegrass, you know. And um, uh, yet, yeah, you know, that'll, you know, croppers don't like it. Um, but I, I, you know, sorrel, dock, you know, they all add to that biodiversity, they all add to that different root development and depth, they all enhance that rhizosphere um, and they're actually palatable or it's a, whether it's in our bush, you know, um, cultivation rushes is a pet hate of most farmers but you will not get any better shelter for lambing ewes or calving cattle, it is the best shelter. The sheep eat the seed heads so there is some nutrition in them. The, the grass grows right up to them, so they don't really occupy a lot of space. And all our dams have rushes in front of them as a filter. And in, and in rushes, there's a whole pile of, of animals, you know, there's frogs and lizards and snakes and you name it. So it's, it's a habitat. And part of that habitat and part of that biodiversity is one of the reasons we don't have red-legged earth mite problems. It's one of the reasons why aphids aren't a problem. It's, we, do, we don't need insecticides because of that biodiversity, I believe. You know, managing the rhizosphere, this gets back to that rhizosphere, and I had a friend who was a hydrologist, so we did a heap of hydrology on this farm because we had our own salting. Anyway, so we put piezometers in. This is in the early 80s. And so we had scold areas and scorch areas created on our farm because of our clearing practices. It was pretty, pretty terrible, and that's why we did this hydrology, you know, piezometers, we did magnetrometry, seismic, a lot of stuff. And um, got, got un so we understood our hydrological issue um, because of that. But it didn't solve the problem. You know, we couldn't solve that problem other than we were just losing pasture like a lot of people did um, and still are. And then we changed our practices from acid fertilizers, which is the, the standard chemical fertilizers, to the mineral fertilizer. Now mineral fertilizer alkaline, quite different. And and the biological practices and and our scold areas started to grow grass. Our barley grass areas started to grow um, lotus and rise. And all we did is change our practice. And, and I know, you know, people say, oh, that's because the salting changed and the water tables. Well, we still monitor our piezometers. So we had no change in water pressure. We had no change in salinity, yet we had a significant change in outcome on the pastures that were being damaged by salting. And I, I, I think, the, a good rhizosphere, a good biological profile in the soil has amazing buffering ability. One of the authors of the books that permaculture uses as a reference point was Shudo Douglas, which is three-dimensional farming, which was absolutely fascinating. And, and the other one was Russell Smith, um, Tree Crops, Permanent Agriculture. So those, uh, those two books really enlightened me to think. So we started looking at putting fodder trees in, in our paddocks uh, in the early 80s. So we grew carobs, honey locust, oaks, um, and a bunch of others. And, and the oaks actually stood out at the end. And subsequently, we've been planting oaks in paddocks now for probably since the early 90s. And um, so we have hundreds of oaks in paddocks. Um, and the sheep absolutely, and the cattle, love the acorns. It's a great fodder, they produce a lot. They're brilliant shade trees, you know, they just have dense shade and the sheep camp underneath them all the time. And they lose their leaves, so you build up, you help build up your carbon pool, you know, in the soil. And the grass grows right up to the trunk in winter, so you, I thought, well this is a no-brainer, and, and, um, and they're tough, they're tough, and, and of course, when we, if we prune them or cut one down, they've, 
the firewood's nearly as good as Jarrah, you know. So we made a decision then that, that we wouldn't plant um, any eucalypts in the paddocks. We'd plant, look, we just finished planting 2,000 eucalypts in, and, and natives in windbreaks. Uh, remnant vegetation, we'd plant eucalypts, but in the paddocks, as paddock trees for shade and, and shelter, would be fodder trees. Um, and, and the other thing about oaks, which we plant all around our sheds and our infrastructure, they've got amazing fire resistance. You know, so, you know, they're a bit like a, a fire break that's metres high, you know. They'll take any amount of ember. This is what I learnt in the forestry. Any amount of firestorm ember without igniting. So suddenly we started being a little bit more strategic in these plantings. And so our shearing shed and our structural sheds and our home, we have a lot of deciduous trees and oaks around them um, as part of our fire management. Well, I think, you know, climate change is a big one. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think bringing that to the forefront, which is happening, um, otherwise I don't think it's going to be, it's going to be a pretty tough environment. Um, oh, I don't know, you know, sometimes old dogs don't, you know, new tricks. Yeah. <laughs> so we need young dogs <laughs> for change. And, 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 and I'm, you know, I, I think you're going to drive the change for sure. You know, I've been out there, we've had, Dozens and dozens of field days on this farm over the 20 years. Um, and, and people are really amazed by our productivity and the way it is, but the change is still really slow because there's a hell of a lot of resistance to change in ag. It's amazing, you know. Part of that's driven, not driven by um, farm income, it's driven by the big players in ag industry, fertiliser, chemicals, agronomy. Um, they need to change. So I, I, I think the first thing that really would be good to see is the advisors and the agronomists starting to go, hang on, it's just not a chemical system. You know, we, you know, and so, you know, we're a biological, we're a chemical, we're a mineral, you know, we're a combination. And you can't just think that, you know, by having 300 kilos of urea, or nitrogen on the paddock's going to improve your production. It may improve the growth, it will not improve your uh, environmental or soil outcomes, and it's very dubious what it does to food quality. Um, so I think young people, you know, there's, it's, it's a big thing on their shoulders because they're, they're going to inherit something that's tough and hard. You know, we're, we're inheriting a climate change, so farms have to be massively more resilient. This is why we have to have a carbon pool. You know, but farms have the opportunity to be sequences of carbon. You know, perennial grazing systems is probably the best way, and Christine Jones is a classic on this, you know, that perennial gra grazing systems will sequence more carbon than, than probably any other system, other than forest everything, you know. The other thing is that sometimes farming's a bit of hard work, it's not all about equipment. Yep. Sometimes you've got to get out there with a shovel and do that and that sort of stuff and, and I think technology isn't all about drones and chemical. Yeah. You know there's a huge techno technological shift in understanding the soil's alive and it's our key asset. Thank you all so much for watching. If you're interested in our online courses, then simply go onto our website with the link below. Uh, and if you wanna see more regenerative media and stories that are similar to what you've watched today, uh, also subscribe to our YouTube channel. It would help us out a lot. Thanks so much.